Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cybersecurity Crash Course for Beginners. In this lesson, we are going to talk about ransomware. We're going to take a look at the history of ransomware, how ransomware can be deployed, and I've got some very special demos and labs that you're really going to want to stick around to watch at the end of the lesson. So this is lesson four in our 12-part Cybersecurity Crash Course. Be sure that you head over to the address listed there so you can grab the companion guide with some of the links to the tools or sites we talk about. You can get some exercises in there to help you improve your cybersecurity at your organization. And with that, let's get started talking about ransomware. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is malware that basically locks up the files on your computer so that you can't have access them. It locks them up and it demands a payment to get them back. There are several kinds of ransomware. Some ransomware only lock files on your system. Some will encrypt your whole hard drive, uh, but it's all ransomware. It locks up your files or your folders or your machines and demands payment for you to gain access back to them. So I wanted to give you a real world example of ransomware to help you see what it actually does so you have a better idea. So I have a copy here of the WannaCry ransomware that spread around the world in 2017 um, after the Eternal Blue exploit. And I'm gonna show you, if I run ransomware, what it does. Now take note, this is a secured environment. This cannot leak out into my network. Um, I don't recommend you do this at home because this is very dangerous and it could damage your systems. So when we run WannaCry here, and of course in real life, I would have been social engineered to do this, or this would have been in a script, in a batch file or PowerShell or something of that nature. And as you can see, the malware has now run or is in the process of running. And we have this please read me file, which was is a telltale sign. Usually the attacker would put this on your desktop somewhere so it's very visible. And the message says that your files are encrypted. If you like them, you're gonna have to pay. What do you need to do? You need to send money to that Bitcoin address. And usually you'll get a pop-up like this about your files being deleted. I'm going to stop the attack at all. I need to keep going for now. But as you can see, everything has changed. Your background has changed now. Um, different variations of ransomware are going to do this differently. Um, but they're all going to give you some kind of pop-up saying you need to pay money. They're going to give you a time limit till your files are deleted um, to add to the pressure to make you have to pay them and the more systems they can infect in your organization the better for them the more chances to get paid and the higher a lot of times their price is going to be because you are really dependent on getting your files back so that's just a quick example of how ransomware works this is real ransomware in our lab um, and i thought you would like seeing it in real life so let's talk about how did we get to where we are today how did ransomware get to be the huge attack vector that it is? Every day we see ransomware attacks. Just in the last week, depending on when you listen to this, the corporation Garmin was locked with ransomware. And what happened? People could not use their garments to get directions. Imagine the impact of that. Ransomware takes out Garmin, and now people can't use their Garmin devices to navigate. The implications of this are huge. How did we get to such an impactful cyber attack in today's environment. The first known ransomware attack on record happened in 1989. So this has been a lot of years in the making. And it was created by an individual who was doing AIDS research named Joseph Pop. Um, Joseph Pop sent 20,000 floppy disks to other AIDS researchers. And this floppy disk had malware on it. And the malware would wait until the system was on for 90 minutes. Then 
it would run and show a message demanding a payment of $189. It also demanded another payment of $378 for a license. And this early ransomware became known as the AIDS virus or the PC cyborg Trojan horse. Um, both interchangeable names for the same ransomware. This was the first in a very rudimentary attempt at ransomware. Come full timeline today and things are quite different. The early versions of ransomware used custom encryption algorithms. Um, this was through the early 2000s up to the late 2000 single digit numbers. And this is part of the reason that we didn't hear as much about it back then as we do now. These custom encryption algorithms were easy to break. So in a lot of cases, it was simple if you got ransomware. It wasn't very difficult to regain access to your files. As the criminals got better, they began using off-the-shelf encryption algorithms, things like AES-256, DES, and much, much more complicated encryption algorithms. Because of this, it got much, much harder to regain access to your files if they were encrypted. And by 2015, it was obvious that ransomware was beginning to wreak havoc across the cyberspace. Shortly thereafter and around that time, we began seeing a rise of ransomware as a service. If you stick around to the end, I've got a special demo and we're gonna go look at a ransomware as a service vendor so you can see just how simple it is for criminals to get their hands on this. And with the advent and the rise of ransomware as a service, the game really started to change when it came to ransomware. We began seeing ransomware deployed all over the place to all kinds of organizations. We saw incidents like the GameZoo botnet. Uh, the botnet was used to deploy ransomware and other ransomware dealers really built a business out of it. They were quite ingenuitive in the way they would go about things and they developed ransomware. They developed the actual malware and they sold it to dealers. These dealers who were resellers, middlemen, set up commission system so that uh, any individual who wanted to deploy ransomware at an organization could come buy it, deploy it, demand a payment, and the ransomware dealer and the ransomware creator would take a cut of that. They made a lot of money in just three years doing this. So how do ransomware attacks happen? And this is not actually an easy answer. There are many ways that ransomware can happen. Ransomware is malicious software. It can start with phishing, getting someone to click on a link that downloads software. It could make use of existing vulnerabilities in a system. Um, this is what we saw with WannaCry. Before WannaCry, the WannaCry breakout that happened, um, Microsoft released patches for the eternal blue vulnerability in the SMB protocol. Organizations who had not updated that were attacked, some of them, and the bad actors use that to deploy WannaCry ransomware. You can get ransomware via RDP vulnerabilities or weak setup. Um, this is a huge risk in organizations. If you have RDP set up externally on the web, attackers can brute force their way into RDP. They can fish a user and get into RDP and then begin moving laterally throughout your network deploying ransomware. There are infected websites is another way that ransomware can be deployed to your device. Um, these, these are websites that auto download software or malware onto your device. Um, we'll talk about a way to stop this in a few minutes. And the final way that I want to point out here, there are many, many more ways, are malicious ads. You have to be careful with ads that can't contain malicious links and malicious code that download malware. They could be droppers, um, stagers for other malware, including ransomware. So how can you prevent ransomware from being deployed in your environment? And there is no silver bullet to this. It takes a layered approach. First of all, I'm gonna recommend that you have a plan in place. 
because no matter how hard you try, no matter how secure you are, there is still a risk that ransomware can get into your environment. Have a plan in place so that you can react very efficiently, very precisely, address the ransomware, and deal with it quickly before it spreads throughout your environment. Understand and figure out how your business is going to stay up and running after a ransomware attack. Plan it out, do tabletop exercises, put this plan into writing and share it with the necessary parties so everyone knows exactly what to do. If a call goes out, ransomware outbreak on the network, everybody knows what to do. They can begin unplugging network devices, turning off switches, whatever they need to do, they are ready and they know exactly what to do. Next is, this is not gonna prevent it, but it can help mitigate the effects of ransomware and that is backing up your data. Regularly save your important files, systems, to a drive or a server that's not connected to your network. And this is gonna be have to be a manual process. Be and you should make this backup part of a routine business operation, create a, um, some kind of guidance, um, a checklist if you want, Every time it's done that it's checked and those backups are checked that they are working. Another important note there, be sure that your backups are tested and they actually work. There's nothing worse than going to use your backup and they don't work. And the reason I recommend using a server or a device that is not connected to your network is because here's how some bad actors will work with ransomware. They'll gain access to your systems they will explore your environment, figure out what software you have, what backups you have, how often you back up, and say your backups go back in 90 days. Bad actors have stayed stealthily inside of an environment for 90 days. Then on day 91, deploy ransomware so that your backups are ruined. And when you try to go to your backups, the backups are encrypted. Another big, big key in preventing ransomware is install patches and updates. If you keep your attack surface minimized, there is less opportunity for an attacker to gain entrance and to deploy ransomware in your environment. One of the biggest attack vectors everyone has is, of course, humans, which we'll get to in a second. But one of the biggest attack vectors is not updating and patching your systems, not updating firmware on network devices, routers, switches, firewalls, updates on operating systems, mobile devices. If you keep all of your devices on your network, in your environment up to date, you will drastically reduce the likelihood that you will be a victim of ransomware. And of course, finally, train your employees. Teach them how to avoid phishing scams and show them the ways that attackers can compromise their devices and infect them. Um, teach them tips how to spot malicious emails, what to do if they accidentally take an action that a bad actor wants, if they log in somewhere and they're phished, if they click a link, etc. Train your employees. We've talked about preventing ransomware, but a huge factor in continuing your business after a ransomware attack is recovery. So let's take a look at ransomware recovery and response, because if you don't respond to ransomware quickly, you can have big issues. Now, before we do, I guess this sort of goes with prevention, but one thing to say is network segmentation is a key. If you segment your network into small pieces, even if someone in accounting gets ransomware, the outbreak won't be able to break out of the accounting department. It won't be able to affect HR, research and development, DevOps, etc. Segment your network into as small of components as possible to mitigate and prevent those types of outbreaks. And on that, as part of your response, you should know exactly what in your network environment talks to what. So say there's a switch between accounting and HR. Ransomware starts breaking out in accounting on a device, go turn off the switch that connects those two departments or the router, if you're talking on a layer three level, 
prevent that spread from spreading outside of that department, then began removing all of those devices and accounting from the network. Unplug them, turn off Wi-Fi, remove them from the network to prevent the spread of the ransomware. Do not turn them off. A lot of people tell you something happens, just turn off your computer. That's a bad idea because there is a lot of valuable log data in there. There is possibly malware injected into memory that is not even written to your device. Um, fileless malware, that could be the reason that the ransomware is deployed. So instead of turning devices off, remove them from the network. Okay, you might lose one device to ransomware, but you have that valuable data in memory. You have it kept in a clean state so that you can run forensics on that and figure out how did these attackers get into your systems. So again, knowing those network choke points, if you will, can be a critical key in preventing ransomware spread around your organization. Next, after a ransomware attack, contact your authorities, your local FBI office. They will help you. They will assist you. They will investigate. They work a lot of these cases and it helps them piece together what's going on when they, when you do actually report to them. And finally, focus on keeping your business operating. This is one of the most critical things you can do for your business. Again, your business is a business. It makes money. So having a plan in place and figuring out how should an attack happen, how to keep your business running is a huge key to the well-being of your organization. And then there's the big question. Should you pay the ransom? I'm not going to give a yes or no answer. Here's what I'm going to say. The FBI does not recommend it because there is a small percentage of the time that you actually do not get the decryption key, even if you pay. There are, is another percentage of the time that you will get the proper encryption key, but some of your data will be corrupted and it still won't work. There has been a few cases in which the individuals paid the ransom and they got the quote unquote decryption key, but the decryption key was actually more malware and it, instead of decrypting the data, it went ahead and completely erased it. So they never got it back again. The next reason the FBI does not recommend it is it helps the attackers continue building their infrastructure. When you pay them, they are there to make money. When you pay them, it helps them improve their tools and improve their processes so they can attack more people with ransomware. And just a little secret here, if you pay the criminals, they take note of it and they're going to come back for more payment. Okay. And like I said, it encourages more ransomware at your organization. It encourages more ransomware at other people's organizations. So now let's go to the lab. Let's take a look at a ransomware market where people can go and buy ransomware to deploy to other people. So as you can see here, we have a ransomware vendor. And this site sells many things, ransomware being among them. But as you can see here, we have an individual selling ransomware for only $350. You see how accessible this is? Anyone can come here and for just $350, they could buy ransomware and deploy it to an organization. The seller here provides the ransomware and all they have to do is get it to the company they want to attack, be that via phishing, however they deliver it is up to them. But I want you to see just how accessible this is this is why ransomware is becoming such the problem that it is today.